In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our prayer to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant, and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me, who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings particularly. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. At the time, all discipline seems a cause not for joy, but for pain. Yet, later it brings the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. We've been talking in this novena about virtue as a perfection of the human person, as a growing into the maturity and perfection of our adulthood, that we might do the good with ease and love doing the good we were made for. And we've been noting how that takes practice. But one of the things that gets in the way of our practice is our lack of the virtue of temperance. As much as I want to grow in virtue, there are so many enticing things around me that distract me from the good I need to do. Mostly we associate this with things like food and drink and sex. The sins against temperance include the sins of gluttony and lust but it plays out in all kinds of other areas in our life. Because it feels so good to be superior to someone else. It's wonderful to have people pay attention to me. It feels righteous to give free course to my anger. And it's fun to hear all the gossip that's going around. So often, the body and the emotions guide us rather than reason. I see the plate of brownies. They look really, really good. I really need to be working on my health, but it'd be totally okay to just have one. Maybe two. Three is... I mean, it's not going to hurt. And the next thing I know, I've eaten half the plate. I hate when that happens at breakfast. There's no question that the brownies are good, but there's a time and a place and a mean, a proper amount. And it's okay that my senses identify that the brownies are good. They should. It's not okay that the body and the emotions are making the decision. Temperance doesn't mean I no longer notice good things. It means my desire for good things can always submit to reason with ease. And therefore, to the ultimate good. 
It means not being swayed from what is right and true by things just because they're enticing. And that means that the body and the emotions are going to have to be disciplined. Not because we hate the body or it's evil, but because we actually love the body. And therefore we want it to be properly ordered. When we engage in that disciplining of ourselves, when we seek to die to self that we might live, we call it mortification. Mortification is about denying the things I want so that I can always be ready to do the good I need to do. As a virtue, we find a universal mortification in Our Lady. A habit of always setting aside her will for the Lord's in all things. And if we want to imitate that universal mortification, we need to engage in the practices of mortification. Often we think of this mortification stuff as things that are external and unpleasant. We might think of fasting or have images of saints with whips or chains or prickly hair shirts trying to suffer as much as they can. But the real center of mortification is internal. And it is always properly ordered by love. We probably don't understand the mortification of the saints because we do not understand their love. And so to grow in our understanding, we need to take a serious look at the most common and widely celebrated forms of mortification. We need to recover our understanding of fasting. Fasting is any change in either the amount or the kinds of foods we eat. And this fact that it involves food is kind of important. We can talk about fasting from television and things like that, but while that can be another form of mortification, the reality is that nobody needs television. We do need food. It's not something you can just give up. And yet there is often a huge gulf between what we want for food and what we need. So because mortification is really about the internal, the best form of fasting isn't to see how long I can go without food or how extreme my diet can be. It's not a test to see what the physical body can take. And we certainly don't fast against our health. Rather, it's about training the body and the emotions. To recognize you don't get what you want just because you want it. A fast that attacks my strongest desires is what will be most effective. And the great thing about a fast is you can challenge yourself with a fast. And if you fail, it's no big deal. Whereas in other areas of our life, like lust, you should never be challenging yourself. You should never put yourself in a situation of lust just to see if you can get out of it. And when we fail in lust... It is a big deal. 
And that makes fasting the perfect training ground. Where we can grow in temperance and have that temperance carry over into every other aspect of our lives. Chastity, self-control, humility, meekness, honesty, studiousness, and modesty are all connected to temperance. Fasting does so many other things for us as well. When we've indulged in sinful desires, what better penance is there than fasting as a sign of our firm intention not to let desire conquer us again? Moreover, most of us do all right in the moral life as long as I'm not tired or stressed or hungry. Then I become a rather horrible person to be with. Fasting allows us to train to be the person we actually want to be, even under slightly less than ideal circumstances. Furthermore, there's no sense in having more of something if it makes you appreciate it less. And conversely, we grow in our appreciation of things when we don't have them all the time. Fasting is always ordered towards feasting. And we rejoice so much more in the simple good things God has given us when we fast in preparation for a feast. Finally, it is an extremely powerful form of prayer. When we fast, we find ourselves thinking about it constantly. I can go almost all day forgetting to eat without a problem. If I decide to fast, I feel like I'm not going to make it to 10 a.m. But if we constantly have it on our minds, then we can constantly remember why we are fasting. And it becomes a constant prayer and offering to God. Our fasting should always be united to prayer. It should always be offered for someone or something. At the time, all discipline seems a cause not for joy but for pain. Yet later it brings the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. Mortification is not some scary word from the old days. It's a word we need to recover so that we can properly order the body and the emotions and grow in virtue. That we might imitate Our Lady who is always able to serve the Lord perfectly because of her universal mortification. This dying to ourselves is also in imitation of him who laid down his life for us on the cross. And so may we, through mortification, learn to die with him, that we might be raised with him to eternal life. And let us conclude then with our novena prayer to Our Lady. O Immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy, you are the refuge of sinners, the health of the sick, and the comfort of the afflicted. You know my wants, my troubles, and my sufferings. By your appearance at the Grotto of Lourdes, you made it a privileged sanctuary. 
where your favors are given to people streaming to it from the whole world. Over the years, countless sufferers have obtained the cure for their infirmities, whether of soul, mind, or body. Therefore, I come to you with St. Jude as my patron to implore your motherly intercession. Obtain, O loving mother, the grant of my requests. Through gratitude for your favors, I will endeavor to imitate your virtues, that I may one day share in your glory. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.